So I'll be talking about protecting the brain and spine during aortic arch uh, surgery. So our volume of aortic surgery has progressively increased over time from about 190 thoracic aortas in the early 2000s to now some 750. At the same time, our open abdominal and even endovascular has declined with time as abdominal aortic stenting has become more of a commodity. So this just shows a breakdown of uh, total aortics uh, for last year with some 1,200 uh, patients and the majority of those are ascending and arch operations. The quandary of what to do with aortic arch protection during circulatory arrest has been ongoing for quite a while. This is based on a study I did many years ago on Dr. Crawford's patients which showed that after 40 minutes of circulatory arrest with deep hypothermia alone the risk of stroke increased and then at 65 minutes shown in green here with the blue arrows it appears that the risk of stroke goes down but that's because we weren't able to assess those patients because they died and so we never knew if they had strokes or not. Back in 1971, there was a paper written by Dr. DeBakey for the first LVADs, and it was actually done by Stanley Crawford, and what he did was he sewed a side graft onto the subclavian artery for the arterial inflow for the uh, VAD. And this clearly was an interesting way of doing it, and I thought this might be a way that we may be able to do aortic arch surgery with uh, also anti-grade brain perfusion. This is the picture of the first patient that was uh, done by Stanley Crawford. So that was the reason for the reason why I started using this subclavian side graft uh, with a tube graft to the artery. I did use the cannulas directly also um, into the subclavian or the auxiliary artery. And then we also put balloon catheters, the gundry balloons, into the nominate and carotid so we could measure pressure within the arteries. We then did a study of some 1,300 patients and looked at various ways of um, doing the aortic arch depending on cannulation site and also the underlying procedure with circulatory arrest and found that the more complex operations, the greater the risk of stroke and mortality as one would expect. And then the overall stroke rate was 6.1%, uh, but with the subclavian side graph, um, the risk of stroke was 4% versus the other methods of 6.7%. So with the propensity matching, this showed benefit over just direct cannulation of the subclavian versus, say, femoral direct uh, arch cannulation. And this just illustrates the 40% reduction in stroke rate with auxiliary cannulation and a, a side graft. So that was one of the reasons why we felt this was very important for brain protection. We then did, a, more recently, a study of anti-grade versus retrograde brain perfusion, and uh, we randomized 121 patients in a randomized trial. And this was for total arch replacements, and about two-thirds of the patients had a elephant trunk procedure uh, put in. And the outcome was uh, somewhat surprising to us uh, because the results were so good. So the clinical stroke rate was only 0.8% and the mortality rate also only 0.8%. But in this study, we did preoperative and postoperative neurocognitive testing and imaging and found that the neurocognitive testing and imaging was obviously more sensitive than clinical diagnosis for brain injury. In this trial, the things we use to protect the brain, and I think all of these are important, is we cool the patients to less than 20 degrees on the nasopharyngeal temperature. We use double coolers for more rapid and, and uh, both rapid cooling and rewarming. 
put the patients in steep head down position, pack the head in ice and use CO2 flooding at 10 litres per minute. I think this is a very important step to get rid of any potential uh, air or gaseous material in the arch. We used the subclavian side graph for inflow as I mentioned and kept pressures at 40 to 60 millimetres of mercury during antegrade perfusion and uh, we did that every 15 minutes for five minutes. So this was not a continuous antegrade, which is an important point. And that's based on the literature showing that that's a very safe method for doing both pediatric surgery and also uh, endarterectomy of the pulmonary arteries. We use retrograde brain perfusion at 20 to 30 millimeters per mercury, but that was continuous. We did the neurological examination on everybody after surgery. So this was done by um, the staff and also um, neurologists. And then, as I mentioned, the pre-op and post-op MRIs and neurocognitive testing. So um, the number of redos in the study was 39%. And as I mentioned, just under two thirds were elephant trunk procedures. So pretty complex group of patients with the mortality and stroke rate, as I mentioned. Now, in imaging studies, we did find either a stroke or a change on the MRIs in 15% of patients. 18% had a neurocognitive decline. Now, this was done uh, three to four months after the procedure, and either of those was 24%. So, um, some of these were obviously very subtle, but on more careful testing, either with imaging or neurocognitive function, there was a decline. There was no difference between antegrade and retrograde brain perfusion, and the strokes that were in the post area and cerebera area and the occiput, those were often silent when it came to either neurological examination or neurocognitive testing. Um, on the other hand, neurocognitive testing uh, obviously sometimes occurred with changes without imaging changes to correlate with that. And this is the pre and post uh, findings. This is on blinded review of the images. And uh, as you can see, there essentially was no change on the uh, imaging studies between the areas pre-op versus uh, post-op. So what about the elephant trunk uh, procedure and uh, methods for doing that? We used to put in the elephant trunk with a side graft attached to the elephant trunk and then pull that out for integrated brain perfusion. The problem with this is that you don't flush uh, any potential gaseous material out of the arch, and so that's one of the benefits of the subclavian artery. More recently, we've classified the procedures um, for the aortic arch depending on where the anastomosis is done. And so one is beyond the subclavian, the twos are between subclavian and carotid, and uh, threes are distal arch with just the distal arch being done. Fours are uh, debranching or doing separate bypasses to the uh, greater vessels. And then the uh, fives, um, somewhat similar, but then anastomosis being done in the ascending aorta and then with elephant trunk procedure. And obviously every one of these you can do as a frozen elephant trunk at the first uh, procedure to avoid doing a second operation. Here's just an important point about the variation also illustrated in those figures, and that is to sew the elephant trunk to the back of a graft that uh, is branched to the greater vessels. That means that the curve is a better curve on the lesser curve without the kinking of the elephant trunk graft. Um, and this is a graft that's available commercially. Um, obviously, the elephant trunk uh, procedure is one option. Then you've also got the frozen procedures, uh, frozen elephant trunks with uh, acute dissections, and this is just illustration of acute dissections as uh, another way of doing these, and obviously new iterations of how to do these procedures with replacement of the arch and also using frozen elephant trunks. Here's just an illustration of a patient who had a gut ischemia and a collapse of the true lumen who was first dented, and then on the left top panel we put an elephant trunk uh, 
into that um, stent that had been placed in the descending aorta and did a reimplantation of the aortic valve and then connected those two uh, to completely repair the ascending aorta and the aortic arch and uh, the elephant trunk was then used for stenting and the descending. Uh, another point is for chronic dissection, it's important to make sure you perfuse both lumens, but preferentially put the elephant trunk in the true lumen, but make sure that it can pu still perfuse uh, the false lumen. Um, this is just a, another illustration of also the option of doing anastomosis between the carotid and uh, the subclavian uh, artery and uh, that uh, is a reasonable way to do the elephant trunk procedures. And then obviously you then go ahead and do the rest of the aorta as a second stage operation with the side grafts as subclavian. I did a number of patients where we replaced the entire aorta during a single operation, so entire thoracic aorta or total thoracic aorta and abdominal aorta. And the mortality rate was 17%, and while it was feasible and could be done, um, the problem was that uh, the mortality rate was high, and so that's why we've gone back to using the elephant trunk uh, procedure for these type of operations. This is just the illustration of the first one uh, we did. There's a patient who had a total circa rest time of um, 60 minutes for the body, but the arch was something in the region of 20 minutes. Um, and he lived for many years afterwards with this total replacement of the aorta. And we had to take two uh, Dacron tube grafts to put them together to get enough length to replace the entire aorta. So the top part and the ascending was done from the front and then the thoracic abdominal through the rest. Here's a more recent type of operation uh, in a patient with using the elephant trunk procedure and then with clips on the end of the elephant trunk and then branch grafts uh, to the greater vessels. Another option uh, for brain protection is doing it off pump. This is a patient who had a brain hemorrhage and also was quadriplegic from a, a parachute injury. A goose collapsed his parachute and so we didn't want to heparinize him and we did a debranching to the greater vessels with um, a side biting clamp on the ascending aorta using a invasive incision and then he had previously had a kinked descending graft put in that uh, had hemodynamic problems and we then stented the rest of his arch to repair that. Here's another patient, a 400 pounder with aortic dissection and I did the first stage with the elephant trunk and then we stented the rest of the second stage and did a bypass graft to his viscerals. We abandoned doing that type of operation when the branch grafts became available and we also found that the mortality rate and paraplegia rate was quite high with these type of operations which was probably not too surprising. Here's another example of a patient with a leaking thoracic abdominal aneurysm and the patient was on home oxygen and also had severe AI. So we put in a valve uh, elephant trunk with uh, the clips on the end of the elephant trunk and a pacing wire so we could straighten that elephant trunk out and I wrapped the aorta above the SMA and then we stented into that wrap to replace her and here's just the post-operative imaging of that. So for um, patients having second stage procedures or uh, endovascular procedures, um, up until 2013 we'd done 673 patients and uh, about a quarter of those were emergencies or urgent. Um, a lot of them were descendings but also thoracos were varying extents of thoracos. We excluded the um, type 4s, Crawford type 4s from this. And in 16%, the arch was covered. We debranched 17%. We used fenestrated grafts in 34%, and CSF drainage in about 58%, and a 98% success rate. There was access injury in 13%, paralysis in 6.1%, permanent stroke in 4.4%, and 10% developed renal failure.
So what were the factors that predicted early death in the study? Well, female age, renal failure, um, previous open heart surgery, emergency and arch involvement late, the predictors as one would expect with dialysis, dissection, aortic size, coronary disease, pacemaker, the thoracic abdominal aneurysms are more extensive, and distal descendings. Stroke was predicted by renal failure, non-elective, and the earlier time period. Paralysis was predicted by age, thoraco, previous abdominal aneurysm replacement, which is something that we've known for quite a long time for open procedures, and use of iliac uh, conduits. And the survival rate was not particularly good at 56% at five years uh, after follow-up. We did another study where we looked at second-stage elephant trunk, either open or endovascular, and in essence, the results were very similar, but more interventions were required in the patients who had endovascular procedures. And he has a long-term survival showing that essentially no difference, although um, after six years, maybe there's some divergence with the open ones um, dying more frequently early, but surviving better later. So endoleaks and reoperations uh, in the two groups uh, were uh, somewhat similar as far as outcomes, but uh, more interventions in the endovascular group. Now, for brain protection, working through the left side and also spinal cord protection, um, the one approach that I found very useful is to just sow a side graft to the subclavian artery and then femoral venous drainage and perfusion also of the artery distally and that way you can do aortic arch operations with circulatory arrest and also protect the spinal cord and this also reduces the risk of stroke and there's just an illustration of a patient uh, that we did that way um, and took care of his arch in fact uh, uh, he was a resident he has another way of doing that so notice the subclavian side graft clamping of the arch and anastomosis once you've done that and then you can go down to the aortic valve to, for the proximal if need be. You can divide the pulmonary artery to get the access and then replace the rest. And that uh, has a pretty good success rate. And then hook up the subclavian. So as we've known for a long time now, based on Dr. Crawford's work, the extent of thoracic abdominal aneurysms predicts the outcome. And there's some predictability also by the descending aorta. Uh, extent and um, this was the classic way that Dr. Crawford used to do it with uh, just clamp and sew and uh, cannulas in the vessels and the, the visceral vessels. I largely went away from doing that uh, during operations because every now and again you dissect or damage the arteries when you put them into the vessels or balloon catheters. But uh, we, d we did find that just direct cooling of the kidneys with um, saline and typically 180 cc's was very effective in protecting the kidneys. And Joe Caselli did a prospective randomized trial showing equivalent results with either cold saline or cold uh, blood uh, into the kidneys was protective. And this is just a summary of the paper that they uh, did uh, with those uh, findings. So one of the things we found in descending aortic repairs was that after about 40 minutes of cross clamping, then distal perfusion with atrofemoral bypass uh, is protective. And so we went to cooling our patients and using atrofemoral bypass. Now classically, in the paper that I wrote up on Dr. Crawford's patients, uh, there were 1,509 thoracic abdominal aneurysm repairs. This is the, so this was clamp and sew. The risk of paraplegia essentially was multiples of others. So type 1, 15%, double of that. You get 30% for the type 2s, half of the 15% for type 3s, and uh, approximately half of that for four is four percent. And that's a good number to remember for historical uh, reasons. If you look at uh, the data coming that's come out from 
uh, Joe Caselli, these uh, risks have been considerably uh, reduced by CSF drainage and the other techniques that Joe Caselli used. And we found that intrathecal papaverine with CSF drainage was also helpful in reducing the risk of paralysis. So w one of the things we did learn from Dr. Crawford's patients, he went through a period where he wanted to keep the patients normothermic, and that resulted in a higher risk of paralysis. And this is the risk of paralysis over time um, by uh, so for Dr. Crawford's patients, and the highest risk are the type 2s. We did some human studies and animal studies looking at spinal cord anatomy and mapped out where the artery of Adampicus comes off with arteria radicularis magna, which is in the lower thoracic aorta in most patients, and felt that it was important for preservation for these extensive repairs. And this is the data on where the ARM is typically found between T9 and T12 in 75% of patients. We did a study where we injected uh, hydrogen in solution into the arteries and then using a platinum electrode detected which arteries uh, supplied the spinal cord. And this is sort of the recording we got from injecting into the intercostal and lumbar arteries. This is an animal study identifying which arteries supplied the spinal cord. This is the setup we used and we used this in humans too. So here's patient uh, where we injected the various segments and found that the distal um, aorta was, uh, the distal descending aorta is where the blood supply to the spinal cord came off. Of interest is the Lamol stent in the ascending aorta for previous dissection. And we then preserved those vessels at T10 and showed with injection again that we had correctly preserved those vessels. And here's the um, highly selective angiography of the T10 uh, intercostal showing the artery of Adamkiewicz there joining the anterior spinal artery. We also showed that with um, femoral bypass or aorta uh, femoral bypass, you could also inject blood into the pump and show that the spinal cord was perfused distally. So in the animal experiments, we showed intrathecal papaverine with CSF drainage was highly successful in improving blood supply to the spinal cord after 60 minutes of cross clamping and also prevented paraplegia in all the animals that had this done. And so we then looked at this in humans and this is the curves for the risk of paralysis according to the cross clamp time and in green cooling the patients with CFDS drainage and intrathecal papaverine had the lowest risk. Um, we then did a study of some 400 patients looking at the risk of uh, paralysis and also propensity matched them and found that uh, both in the matched and the unmatched, the risk of paralysis uh, was reduced by use of intrathecal papaverine and CSF uh, drainage. Uh, this also had uh, a more of a protective effect in the type 1 and type 2 thoracoabdominal aneurysms, and the permanent deficits were also reduced using intrathecal papaverin with CSF drainage, and um, the incidence of complications was also lower, and we know that paralysis is associated with more complications, so that's not too surprising and long-term survival was better in the patients who had intrathecal papaverine. And um, this is uh, also survival by permanent deficit versus uh, no permanent deficit. And as we know from previously, the patients with a permanent deficit have a poor survival. So as far as um, the intrathecal papaverine, it adds to the protection of the spinal cord and is associated with reduced complications. So then other clinical implications are of this apart from using it for open procedures is should it be used in TVAR and as I showed you in the earlier um, um, slides we do a lot of CSF drainage and uh, we've been looking at using it also uh, with intrathecal papaverine. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and um, I hope you found this useful, and um, we believe that every life deserves a world-class
heart and vascular care, and that's our little logo we use for the Heart and Vascular Institute.